Hey guys, today we're looking at the HL component of 2.3, Macroeconomic Objectives. In this section, we'll be covering the following. Calculating the unemployment rate from a set of data. Constructing a weighted price index from a set of data. Calculating the inflation rate from a set of data. Examining the relationship between inflation and unemployment, namely the Phillips curve. We'll calculate economic growth rates from a set of data as well and we will calculate marginal and average tax rates. First we'll look at calculating the unemployment rate from set of data. We have already looked at this in class, so we'll be brief. Here is a typical set of data that you might get in paper 3. Where people tend to go wrong is thinking that the unemployment rate is the total number of unemployed divided by the population. We know that this isn't true. People who aren't actively seeking work are not counted as unemployed. Therefore, the equation that we're looking for is the total number employed, unemployed divided by the labour force times 100 to get our percentage. The labour force, of course, being the total number of people either employed or actively seeking employment. The math is simple, you just plug in the numbers. The total number unemployed is just the total labour force minus those employed. So you just put in the numbers and follow it through and we get an unemployment rate of 4.62%. Remember that you must include the percentage sign. 4.62 by itself will not get you the full marks. Now we're looking at constructing a weighted price index using a set of data. This is essentially how CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is derived. For this course, we keep it much simpler. We don't look at every item or an economy. We'll assume that this economy has just four goods. Beef, baseballs, bracelets and bicycles. The first column shows the amount of good of the good that is included in the basket of goods. So this is what the average household buys. So the average household buys 21 bracelets. This is the weighted. Price indices aim to be as accurate as possible to match actual consumption habits of the population. These weightings need to be kept constant in order to make comparisons and for this exercise we'll use 2011 as our base year. Every index need a base year, needs a base year so that comparisons can be made. We'll construct the weight price index for 2011. The equation is as follows. Price index in year n equals the value of the basket in year n over the value of the basket in the base year times 100. So we'll plug in the numbers there, 510 over 510 times 100 equals 100. This will, the price index for the base year will always equal 100 because that's the base that we work from. Now we'll construct the weighted price index for 2012. So we follow the same equation and plug in the numbers. 573 divided by 510 times 100 equals 112. It's important to remember here that indices do not have units. So it's not $112, 112 inflations, it's just 112. You will be penalised for giving incorrect units, so be careful. Once we have the weighted price indices, it is relatively easy to calculate the inflation rate. The equation is as follows. Price index in year n minus price index in previous year over the price index in previous year times 100 to get the percentage. To find the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012, we plug the numbers in. Follow it through and get to 12%. So remember the price index in 2012 was 112 and the price index in the previous year was 100 and we divide that by 100. As you can see, it's very easy when comparing to the base year. You would have been able to see without a calculator that the inflation rate in 2012 was 12%. Let's now add the weighted price index from 2013, say it's 116, to find the inflation rate from 2012 to 2013. 
We'll plug the numbers in. 116 minus 112 over 112 times 100%. This comes out to 3.57%. So you can see that for examples like these, you will need to remember the equation. Next we'll look at possible relationships between unemployment and inflation. The short run Phillips curve shows an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. It's named after William Phillips, this handsome New Zealand born economist. We've seen this Phillips curve relationship already ourselves. There often seems to be a trade off between inflation and unemployment. This will make more sense when we look at an ADAS diagram on the next slide. You can see that with an increase in aggregate demand, AD to AD1, and AD1 to AD2, the price level increases while the unemployment rate decreases. This gives the shape to the Phillips curve as can be seen. When inflation is high, unemployment is, is low. And when inflation is low, unemployment is high. The short run Phillips curve can shift outwards. This would be caused by a decrease in the short run aggregate supply curve. So for example, in the 1970s, there was an oil crisis which caused the cost of production of goods and services to increase. Because as the price of oil increases, it's a factor of production for almost everything. The price of oil increases, the price of everything increases. The result was higher inflation and higher unemployment happening at the same time causing the shift outwards. This is otherwise known as stagflation. The long run is a little different. In the long run, the Phillips curve is vertical at the full employment level. So this suddenly looks very familiar. It's the long run aggregate supply curve. We can show why the negative relationship between inflation and unemployment does not hold in the long run. We've seen this before. Let's say AD increases to AD1, causing a rise in the price level and a decrease in unemployment. This is short term. The Phillips curve theory holds. In the long run, however, as employers see their buying power eroded by inflation, they will demand higher wages so they can buy what they previously had before. They can maintain their, their standard of living. When they demand higher wages, it's a decrease in short run aggregate supply. So it shifts it to the shifts the SRAS curve to the left, back to the full employment equilibrium. Therefore, in the long run, the negative relationship does not exist. We have higher price level, but no change in unemployment. Okay, calculating the rate of economic growth. All we need to calculate the economic growth rate are the real GDP, GDP figures of the two years. You may have to calculate these, but you've already learned how to do that in 2.1. The equation is simple. Real GDP in the current period minus the real GDP in the previous period over the real GDP in the previous period times 100 to get the percentage. Here we have the real GDP figures for Bornstein in 2013 and 2014. All we do is plug the numbers in, show our working, and remember to include that percentage sign, as without it, you won't get your full marks. So you can see that comes out to 2.86%. Lastly, we'll look at calculating the marginal rate of tax and the average rate of tax from a set of data. Here we have a set of progressive tax rates. We'll use these for our example. These are pretty close to what Australia has currently. We've got Henry here earning $84,000 per year. To work out the average rate of tax he pays, we first have to work out the total tax that he pays. For his income in each of the brackets, he pays the tax in the right hand column. So for the first $20,000 he earns, he pays zero tax. $20,000 at 0% equals zero. For the next 19,000 between 20 and 39,000, he pays 15% tax. For the income between 39 and 75,000, he pays 31% tax. 
And for the income over 75 and up to his salary of 84,000, he pays 43% tax. After plugging the numbers in, we work it out and the total tax that he pays comes to be $17,880. This question is answered poorly in exams, despite it being relatively simple. The most common mistake here is to think, oh, he earns $84,000, that puts him in the 43% tax bracket, so therefore he pays 43% of $84,000. That's incorrect, so don't be the person who makes that mistake. Moving on to his average tax, all we do is divide the total tax he paid by his income and times by 100. Plug the numbers in and we find his average tax rate is 21.29%. Again, make sure you put in the percentage sign. Now his marginal tax rate is 43% as well as current earnings of $84,000. Each additional or marginal dollar is taxed at 43%. And that's it for HL macro macroeconomics. Nothing too hard there, I don't think.